cleansed from all unrighteousness and against the cleansed vessel that walks in the Spirit. It's the one that the Spirit utilizes to uh, uh, serve and uh, work with. And also it gives us the opportunity to truly learn the Word of God as we walk in the light of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So with a moment of silent prayer, if necessary, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this day in praise and worship and in glorification of you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we can't thank you enough for all that you have given to us and our families, all the blessings that you pour out onto us each and every day, especially the blessing of your word that you are now giving us so that we uh, can be edified within our souls, so that we learn more about our relationship with you and walk in your glory more and more, serving you and our fellow man each and every day. And Father, we continue to pray for our nation. We ask that you watch over, protect, and guide it being with our president and all of those in his uh, cabinet and also in our civilian government, both here at the state level, uh, locally, and also nationally. We just ask that you be with all of them to make good, wise decisions that honor our various constitutions at the state and the federal level. And then also that they also honor your word and your divine establishment principles to your glory. And Father, we pray for our local firemen and policemen. We ask that you watch over and guide and protect them. We also pray for our military that stands on guard on our behalf around the world. We ask that you be with them and lead them to be successful in all their endeavors, heal those who have been wounded. And for those who have given the greatest sacrifice, Father, we thank you for their service, and we ask that you be with their loved ones to bring healing. And Father, we also pray for all the members of our local assembly. We ask, we first thank you for all that you have given and provided to each and every one of us. We ask that you continue to provide all of our logistical grace needs so that we can go forward glorifying you and honoring you doing your will. And if anybody out there has any uh, illnesses or sicknesses or any financial difficulties or whatever the problems may be, fa Father, or trials and tribulations, you know what they are. We just ask that you be with them, answer their prayers, give them strength by your word and by your spirit, all to your glory so that they can walk victoriously in this life. So, Father, we thank you for our time being gathered here together this evening. We ask that you lead us now to lift up our hearts in song and in praise and then in concentration on your word in Christ's precious name. Amen. And if Terry would like to come forward for our doxology, <clears throat> you could all rise, please. He is Lord. He is Lord, he has risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, and please be seated. <clears throat> All right, thank you for the doxology. Now let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. And as you know, in this book, we're studying how to walk in uh, God and in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so that we ultimately are imitators of God Himself, having a like mind as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did while He was here on planet Earth, having the mind of God that is now given to us in the Word. We need to take that in and walk with that, making good, wholesome, righteous, uh, and just decisions and loving decisions each and every day. So we are commanded to walk in love, light, and wisdom. Now we're focusing walking on light, as we note in verses 8 through 14 in our passage this evening. So now this is the second section. Again, we are, we are to be imitators of God and walking in the light of God and especially the light of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in verse 8, we understand, it says, uh, uh, go back to verse 7, it says, Therefore, do not be partakers with them. 
And that's talking about those involved in idolatry and a sinful lifestyle, those who are steeped in Satan's cosmic system, living a worldly life. Again, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Then in verse 9 it says, For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, as it says, trying to please or trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Again, pleasing to the Lord is also synonymous with the fragrant aroma that we noted back up in verse 2. So here we're talking about our former manner of life, which we wrapped that up on Tuesday night, walking in darkness. We understood the doctrine of darkness, what that means, basically sin and evil, and also a euphemism for death as well. So it's really talking about our spiritually dead state when we walked by our old sin nature, walked steeped inside of Satan's cosmic system, walking inside the world, rather than living in the, in the light of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which we're going to note this evening. So again, we talked on Tuesday and Sunday about walking in darkness that we are not to be doing. That's the old way of living. Now we are to walk in the light of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we pick it up with that phrase, but now you are light in the Lord. So before we get to the commandment of walking in light, which is what we're going to see in just a minute, we are first reminded that we are light. So what do we have before us? Well, we have our position in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as God has reminded us time and time again throughout this, uh, these scriptures and throughout the entire New Testament, He reminds us first of our position that we have been made holy, we have been made righteous, we are a new man, we're a new creature, a new spiritual species, and we have been given all kinds of blessings from the moment of our salvation that we have for all of eternity, and we can't lose those things. God always likes to remind us of that first, especially before He gives us a command now to do something. And why does He do that? Well, to motivate us, to remind us that this is who we are. Again, we're not of the darkness. We're not of Satan's cosmic system. We're not of a sin nature. We're not a dead, dying creature any longer. We are a new, vibrant, life-giving and life-breathing creature that now is walking in light. So God always tells us what our position is so that we remind ourselves, as you should be reminding yourself each and every day, that you're a child of God. You are or have been created in holiness and righteousness and truth, as we noted in chapter 4. And you are, as we're noting this evening, you are a creature of light. You have been made light. And that light that you have been made, as it says, you are light in the Lord. And again, in the Lord always reminds us of our union with Jesus Christ, that we are one with Him. We are one body. He is the head. We are the body with Christ. We are His wife uh, or betrothed. He is the bridegroom and ultimately in heaven will be the wife. He'll be the husband. The two shall become one, as we know. So it reminds us in Christ we have been made light. And that light is what we're talking about in this passage and all that it understands, which is the complete opposite of darkness. Darkness with sin and evil and death. This is the complete opposite of that. It's holiness, it's righteousness, it is life. So again, we are reminded of the position that we've been given, the positional sanctification. We've been set apart. We have been made holy because of our union with Jesus Christ. And God does that to encourage us to now go forward in that mode of operation. Go forward in this new life that you are now, or you have been created. Go forward in the new nature that God has given to you, not the old nature of sin and evil and worldly thinking. Again, now live as children of light as God has made us, made us His beloved children of light. So that reminds us when we see again, we, are in, we have been made light in the Lord Jesus Christ, or we are light in the Lord Jesus. Ultimately, we are called, now called to walk as children of light. So we have our position in that we are light in the Lord Jesus. Then we also understand our experiential sanctification, the daily walk that we need to have each and every day. And as we've talked about before, that Greek word peripateo, that means walk. And it really doesn't just mean putting one foot in the other and just walking around, okay? It means a lifestyle, how you live, what you do, how you function each and every day. And we are the children of God, as we were reminded also back up in verse 1. Now we're also reminded of our childhood status because now we're also children of light. 
And as God is light, we are children of light. We are His children. That family relationship, the position that we have coming to the fore, once again being a child of God, but we are to walk in that childlike nature, walk in the light of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and walk in His light as we go forward each and every day. We're going to talk about that as we go forward. So the Greek word for light is phos. Again, that's where we get our word phosphorus from, or even uh, sometimes photos, you'll see that. Uh, in different uh, cognates where we get our word photograph from. But phos is that Greek word. And again, this is a word that has been used many times in the Greek language outside of the Bible and also very often within the Bible as well. And there are all kinds of analogies in regard to light and things that have been given to us within Scripture. Outside of Scripture as well, inside of Scripture, light is analogous for many, many things. The main things that it is analogous for is the first, that it is analogous for life. So when it says walk in light, it's talking about walking in the new life that you have been given, the new spiritual life that you have been created in. Where walking in darkness was talking about walking in spiritual death. Now that we walk in light, now that we have been made light and we are in light in the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately it talks about the new life that we have each and every day. Light also throughout literature, Greek literature and also scripture, talks about the intellectual aspect of it, the illuminating factor of light, how it illuminates things, but talking about how it illuminates your mind and your thought process. In other words, you have knowledge, you have understanding, you have wisdom. So this word light brings all of this together for us. It talks about a life that we should be living, and it also talks about the knowledge and the way we ought to think in that life. So when we are commanded to walk in light, we are commanded to walk in the new life that we have and walk in that knowledge that we have been given called the Word of God, Bible doctrine, which is also the mind of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Also, we see metaphorically in Scripture and outside of Scripture <clears throat> that light denotes victory, deliverance, happiness, good, and also goodness. All of these different things are used, uh, again, by an, uh, in analogy or even euphemistically in regard to the word light. And again, these all apply to our spiritual life as well because we have been given victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we walk in the light of Jesus Christ, we will be an overcomer, a Nikeo, we will be victorious. We've been delivered. Again, we've been delivered from the slave market of sin. And each and every day as we walk in the light, we are delivered from sin. Because if you're not walking in light, what are you walking in? Sin. And you're being overwhelmed by sin and the sin nature and Satan's cosmic system. And then we understand good and goodness, how we should be functioning and operating, producing divine good each and every day. So light has an analogy for all these different things. Life, it has an analogy for victory, for goodness. Oh, I did, and I didn't, uh, again, I mentioned it, but can talk about happiness as well. Again, sometimes, you know, bringing light to a situation. Again, it's talking about happiness and having the joy of Jesus Christ resonant within your soul. So again, light speaks to all of those things. So when we see a phrase or, or a passage like we have here, again, but you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light, we are to walk in all of those genres, knowing that we have a new life, knowing that we've been delivered from the slave market of sin, knowing that we are victorious in the Lord, that we also have the joy and happiness of God available to us, and we are to be producing divine good each and every day. All of these things should be in view as we go forward especially when we have the mind of Jesus Christ resident within our soul. And again, the illumination aspect of light. Again, without the illumination aspect of having the mind of Jesus Christ resident within your soul, you're not going to experience any of these things. You may have them positionally, and you'll enjoy them when you get to the eternal state, but to live here on planet Earth in that same state and to experience these things and to be experientially sanctified, glorifying God each and every day, we truly have to have the illumination aspect of having the mind of Jesus Christ resident within our soul. So we are commanded, as I noted, to walk as children of light. Again, peripateo is the Greek word. Has is the word that 
is translated as. And then we have technon phos. We have phos once again for light. And then the word technon is that word for children. It's the same Greek word that we saw back in verse 1 where we were called beloved children of God. So again, we see the linkage back to verse 1 as we are, are called to be imitators of God. There we, we, we were called the beloved children of God. Here we're now called the children of light, which too is speaking of an aspect in regard to who and what God is, as I'll also share with you in upcoming slides in just a minute. Uh, but basically, this word technon, it does mean children or child or offspring, you know, uh, relative, things like that. But it also was used within the Greek language, as many of you should know, and you probably do, but I'll remind you if you don't or don't recall. But it also talked about the student teacher relationship. And the technon was the student. And when, you know, back in the ancient Greek days, you know, the giving of philosophy and the teaching of information was highly regarded in that Greek society. And that's where we get all those Greek, you know, playwrights of Plato and uh, Aristotle and all these other guys came from that culture. And it was very important for them to pass on knowledge and information to the next generation. And they would be the teacher giving information to the students. And there was a great loving relationship there where the teacher wanted the highest and best for his students. And so they had all the knowledge that was given to them. Now they prepared it in such a way to teach it to their student so that what? The student could walk the same way and have the same knowledge that they had as well. And that's another great analogy of what God desires for you and I. God has this fantastic knowledge. He has fantastic wisdom. He has fantastic uh, understanding and discernment. As you know, Solomon was given that great wisdom by God. And oh, guess what? Solomon wrote that down and now it's been given to us too. And we have even greater wisdom as we continue to learn uh, what Scripture has to say. So our Father in heaven, God our Father, desires us to know this fantastic information that has been given to us in Scripture. It's his A number one desire because if we don't have that information, we don't have a relationship with him. If you never learn the gospel, you never come to salvation. If you never learn the principles and precepts after the gospel, you'd never enter into a close, intimate relationship with God in this life. So again, your heavenly Father has love for you. You are his beloved child, and now he wants you to be a child of light as well. He is light. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. It's part of his essence, part of his attribute, just as he is love. But when we talk about the life that he's given to us, the knowledge that he's given to us, the victory that he's given to us, the holiness, the goodness that he's given to us, he wants to give us that each and every day and provide that for us. And so therefore, as you know, he's developed a process in order to train us and to teach us. And again, starting with the pastor teacher and the local assembly, but even more importantly, the grace apparatus for perception where God the Holy Spirit is working in me, working in you, so that we can understand the spiritual phenomenon that is the Word of God. So technon is that Greek word that gives us that understanding, not that, that we're just part of the family of God, which is a great thing to be a part of, but even more important that God wants us to learn some fantastic information called Bible doctrine. And that should be our A number one priority in life. Again, I know there's a lot of you know, uh, opposing priorities that you all have in life, whether it be the job or the family or the kids or whatever the case may be. But your number one priority in life should be to learn the Word of God and apply it within your life. That's how you're going to succeed in this life. Again, not from the worldly standard, although you may succeed from the worldly standard. That's neither here nor there because it really doesn't matter whether you exceed in the worldly standard or not, but you absolutely will exceed in the heavenly spiritual uh, status of life that has everlasting value and glorification, not only to you, but to God as well. And remember, you know, we've read all the scriptures re recently, you know, don't, you know, build up riches here on earth because, you know, where rust and moth can destroy them. You know, instead, buy the gold that's refined by God. Again, take in His Word because that will never rust or decay. And you will have that forever and ever and ever. And so the stuff that we have here on this life, yeah, you can enjoy that while you're here, but remember, it's only going to be while you're here, that little bitty time of your life, 
compared to the eternal life that you're going to be living forever and ever and ever. So if we build up as students of the Word of God or students of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and build up our soul with the light called the knowledge of our Lord, the mind of Jesus Christ, that is going to be with us forever and ever and ever and ever. And the blessings and rewards that come with it also will be with us for all of eternity. So when we talk about, uh, you know, walk as children of light, it means that we need to reside inside of God's power system. I like to call that GPS. Again, because as you all may have a GPS either on your phone or in your car, again, what does that do? It gets you from one place to the other. It points you in the right direction. It tells you how to go from A to B. Well, that's what the Word of God does too. It points you in the right direction and it shows you the path that you should be walking on each and every day. And God's power system is the combination of being filled with God, the Holy Spirit, plus having the Word of God, the mind of Christ, resident in your soul so that ultimately you are applying it. So when we talk about GPS, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and applying the Word of God consistently and daily, not just every once in a while, not just here and there, and certainly I I know for uh, all of you and hopefully none of you, even those listening, treat the Word of God like a hobby because that's the last thing it should be to you. This is not a hobby, okay? This is life. This is life. And this is the most serious thing that you could absolutely do in life for all of eternity. So again, this is not a hobby. It's not a once in a while, I'll pick it up here, pick it up there, when I feel like it, when things are going good or when things are going bad. It should be a consistent lifestyle that we ought to walk in each and every day. And when we do, we are then the children of God, the technon, which also, again, as I said, indicates that we are beloved students, where God loves you so much that He wants to share His thoughts with you. He wants to share His thinking with you. And you all, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think as I look out at the audience and those people online, maybe not, uh, you all have another, uh, 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 another significant other in your life, okay? You all have a significant other in your life, husband or wife, or maybe a close boyfriend or or girlfriend, or maybe just a close friend as well. Well, that husband or wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, or close friend or relative, it could even be sometimes, the person that's closest to you, that's the person that you share the most intimate things of your life. And you want them to know about what you're thinking. You want them to know how your day went. You want them to know, you know, uh, what is going on in the mentality of your soul. And you should also want to know what's going on in the mentality of their soul. You should know that, people, okay? You should take interest in your partner there. But in any case, just kidding. But, uh, we, sh- we, you know, we want to know the most intimate aspects of each other's lives. And you see, that's what God wants for us. He wants to know the most intimate aspects of our life, as He does. But again, He wants us to share that with Him voluntarily. He already knows these things, but He wants us to freely give of ourselves as a fragrant aroma and an offering, giving of ourselves in thought to our Lord each and every day. And oh, by the way, He wants to give of Himself to you by giving you His Word each and every day. But again, if we're not going to take in His Word, it's like we're saying to our husband or wife, I'm too busy today, you know, I'm, I'm going off on my own direction. I don't want to hear from you. I don't need you. I don't need to talk to you. I don't really care what's going on in your life. I'm just going off in my own direction. You see, that's what it's like when we say, I don't need to take in or I don't want to take in the Word of God. So, again, God desires this close, personal, intimate relationship with us. And the only way we can achieve that is by learning about how He thinks and how He functions and operates and then sharing with Him that knowledge of ourselves as well and living in that new life, living in the new nature that God has created for us. So when we are the technon, again, the students of God, the technical students, again, technon, where we get our word technical from, but also, again, love, uh, beloved children, and being the children of God that he wants to share his most intimate thoughts with, which he's given in his word. So God desires that we learn uh, the knowledge of him and the knowledge that he has given to us found in his word. Just like those ancient teachers back in the Greek and Roman days, and even like we go to school today and we are educated by our teachers today. Again, they're taking knowledge that they have and they're departing it to us so that ultimately we now have that knowledge ourselves. And when you have that knowledge, again, as they say, knowledge is powerful, right? Knowledge is power. 
And when you have the knowledge of the mind of Christ, you don't have to go running to this person or that person and say, what should I do in this situation? What should I do in that situation? You'll have all the information necessary to know what to do and how to do each and every day. And you'll be able to go forward in the spiritual life. That's why we call that level of spiritual adulthood spiritual autonomy. It's not that we don't need to learn the Word of God anymore. It's just that we don't need to have other people be telling us what to do in life situations, especially in regard to the spiritual life. How do I do this? Or how do I do that? Or what's rebound about? And what's the you know, grace apparatus for perception? You, know, you don't have to ask people that anymore because you know it. And you live it, you walk in it, you function in it each and every day. That's what God desires from each and every one of us. That's what it means to walk in the light of God. Again, walk in the light of God. Because light really talks about the knowledge that is God that He has available to us. And remember that phrase, in the Lord. Again, it's based on who and what Jesus Christ is. And it's based on what Jesus said about Himself and what He said about us as well. Again, in the Lord. Yeah, we talk about the union of Jesus Christ, but remember, in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, again, therefore, He spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows Me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. And again, you won't walk in darkness, you will have the light of light. And as we said, when we have darkness in our soul, as we just studied over the last two sessions, excuse me, what does darkness represent? Again, you don't know where you're going. It's like you've got to put your hands out. I'm not, I, don't, I could fall off a cliff. I wouldn't even know it. I don't know what's happening here. I can't see you know, two steps in front of me. Really, it talks about living in the sinful lifestyle. And that, when we live in a life, uh, sinful lifestyle, we won't have a personal sense of destiny. We won't know where God is taking us and what He's doing with us. And we'll be lost and confused. But when we walk in the light of Jesus Christ as He, His light... Again, all will be illuminated to us. We'll be able to understand, oh, that's why this is happening. Oh, I understand this aspect. I understand that aspect. I get this. I get that. I know where to go. I know what to do. I know what word to utilize in this situation, etc., etc., etc. So, again, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. Then in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world. Now he's talking about us, believers. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And so this even takes it up a notch, which we're not going to talk about too much here. But again, when he calls us and says, We're the light of the world, guess what? We're the ones that need to now illuminate the lost and dying dark world that is out there. Jesus came into this world to be the light of the world. Now he's pass that baton on to you and I, called the believer of the church age, we now are the lights of the world, taking not our own light, but the light of Jesus Christ, called His Word and His mind, and sharing that with our fellow mankind. So they don't walk in sin and darkness. They they aren't lost and uh, fearful and worrying and doubting about every aspect and situation of life. Again, they have can have 20-20 vision and know where they are going and what is going with the trends of history and what's happening in the end times and all the other things that God has shared with us. Again, when we have the light, we know these things, now we ought to share them with our fellow mankind as best we can. And as it says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And this this is kind of interesting. I just like thinking about that a little bit because basically what it says, if you are walking in the light in your own personal life, God is going to use you. Plain and simple. He's going to use you one way or another. And He's going to use you to be a light to other people. Again, because He's not going to hide the light, is He? No, He's not. It's a set on a hill. And everybody can see it. He's not going to hide your light. He's going to let that shine as bright as possible. The only one that can hide your light is you. By not taking in the Word, not applying the Word, not staying filled with the Holy Spirit, getting caught up in Satan's cosmic system, living like the rest of the world does, rather than being a difference maker and shining differently from the rest of the world. If everybody else is jumping off the bridge, don't go jumping off the bridge because you know that's wrong. Again, shine the light of Jesus Christ and show them what truth and righteousness and holiness is and don't just be the lemming you know, following the herd down into destruction. So the lost generation of Israel, 
Jesus said to that generation in John chapter 12, verse 36, While you have the light, believe in the light, in order that you may become sons of light. So again, this is a call to salvation. He was only there for a period of time. While you have the light, believe in the light. Well, guess what? You and I have an opportunity right now. Yeah, we're already saved, but we also have the light called the mind of Jesus Christ. While that is with us, let us walk in it. Let us take it in. Let us believe in it so that we become children who are also walking in light. You see, we don't know necessarily how much longer the United States of America will be a client nation. That could end soon. And then, oh, by the way, Christianity is outlawed. And no longer can we gather peacefully and freely the way we do today. The Word of God may be taken from you, and you won't be able to learn it or teach it, and the Bible could be outlawed from you, and you won't have the same opportunity that you do today. So again, in analogous to what Jesus said to Israel, while we have the availability of the light in front of us to learn and understand, let us take advantage of that so that we can walk in the light of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul also commanded in Romans chapter 13, verse 12, he says, The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. I think I talked about this either Sunday or Tuesday, this armor of light, which is analogous to the armor of God that we're going to see in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, beginning in verse 12, or 10 and 12. But... This armor that God has for us is also called the armor of light. And again, we don't need, you know, uh, you know uh, 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 metal and uh, I'm trying to think of things like flak jackets and, you know, different armor that you can put on. We don't need that. We don't need that in the spiritual realm. But what we do need is the light of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when you have the Word of God resident within your soul, guess what that is? It's like that armor of the ancient, you know, gladiators or the, no, not gladiators, crusaders, let's say, when they used to wear the knights in shining armors. That's where I'm trying to go with this, okay? It, it's like those old days when they were protected from warfare because of the armor that they wore. And again, in order for us to have the armor to fight the battles of the spiritual warfare and not be overrun by them, we must have the light of Jesus Christ in us. The night is almost gone. Again, it's almost time for us to be called home and be with the Father forever and ever and ever and sin and evil and darkness to be done away, done away with. The day is at hand. Again, let us therefore lay aside the deeds that encumber us, the deeds of darkness that overwhelm us so much in this current day that we can call night because it's Satan's cosmic system. Again, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and then do what? Put on the armor of light. So even though the world may be in darkness, we can still put on the armor of light and live in that light, again, living in holiness and righteousness, again, serving and glorifying God and also saving souls uh, from Satan and his cosmic system. And also our Lord commanded the believer in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, similar to what we just read about the city set on a hill, it said, "Let let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. Again, let it shine in such a way so they see your good works. Now, you've got to be careful with that one because I know a lot of people end up doing works so that people can see them, okay? But again, see your good works. When you were doing divine good production, it's not about us and what we have done, but it's about what Jesus is doing through us, what the Holy Spirit is doing through us, and what God is doing through us. And that's the work that we are to be showing, glorifying the Father who is in heaven. So that is now leading us to the doctrine of light, uh, which we'll spend the rest of the time we have together tonight, and then we'll uh, probably finish this up on Sunday morning. But in this, we're going to talk about how the Bible utilizes the word light and the different aspects of it, and what that means to us in regard to our passage and our spiritual walk as children of light. So as I said at the outset as well, in addition to the literal use of light in Scripture, because sometimes it just talks about the sun and the moon being light and the stars being light uh, in in the night uh, sky, as we noted in Genesis chapter 1 this past week, in addition to the literal use of light in the Bible, it's also used to represent all three members of the Trinity. You know, all three members of the Trinity are described as light, various times, and we have one of those in our passage as well. 
It can be used for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes light is used by analogy for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The light has come into the world. Well, yeah, Jesus literally came into this world, but what did He come to do? Give the gospel message. He came to pay for those sins so that ultimately people could know the gospel and come to salvation. So light is used for the gospel message. Light is also used for the rest of Scripture as well. Again, all the Word of God is light. And again, harking back to our passage where we ought to walk in that light, walk in the Scriptures, having the knowledge of Bible doctrine resident within our soul. Light is also used to describe angels, both fallen and elect angels. As you know, the elect angels, they are um, um, made uh, of light, as it were, or their light shines forward, and they have the glory of the Lord shining through them. We see light there. But we also see the fallen angels who have the same body as the elect angels right now. But we also see them, as we talked in the doctrine of darkness, how they disguise themselves as what? Angels of light. So they try to look like an angel of light, but they mix up the doctrine. They falsify it enough to lead people astray and get them away from the plan of God. Also, light is used for the spiritual life, including the super grace life that we ought to be living each and every day. It's used for holiness, that you live in the holiness and also righteousness of God, that you live in that that, uh, that holy sphere of God each and every day. We talked about it representing life as well. And there are several other things that it also represents that are you know, kind of similar and synonymous with the things that we've already noted. So light is a very pliable word, I guess you could say, in Scripture where it's used in analogy for many, many things. But it really all harkens back to God and who God is. Because even when you talk about the lights in the sky, well, you can't look at those lights in the sky and say, they just got there on their own. You have to remember God is the creator. And so it brings you right back to God. If it's a spiritual life, it brings you back to God. If it's a trinity, God, gospel, God, scripture, God, angels, God. It all brings us back to God and who and what he is because God is light. And so all the different analogies that it utilizes always brings us back to the source of light being God himself. So it illustrates the essence of God as we've uh, seen and read previously in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to either do that Sunday or maybe a little bit coming up based on what point it's in. But again, it illustrates the essence of God that he is light. And as it says, you know, in, in, well, let's just go there. Let me just go there now. Might as well. First John chapter 1. Let's go to First John chapter 1. And, you know, anytime I say First John, I know you're all being, you know, the first thing that comes in your head. First John 1, 9, rebound technique, okay? And that's all you probably think about sometimes, you know? But it's very important for us to understand what the rebound technique is all about, what 1 John 1, 9 and the confession of sin is all about, because it all has to do with our fellowship with the light, with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, And this is the message we have heard from Him, and announced to you that God is light. Excuse me, and in him there is no darkness at all. We could say there is no sin at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, walk in sin under our, the control of the old sin nature, we lie and do not practice the truth. And again, that's the one that says, Yeah, I have a relationship with God, I have a relationship with God, but yet you're always walking in sin. And you're not walking in the light because, first and foremost, you haven't confessed your sins. And secondly, you're not applying the word of God to not sin in the future. Then in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. And again, this is post-salvation, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, even cleansing us now experientially from our sin. Positionally, that happened at salvation. Now it's experientially uh, as we go forward. Either we're walking in darkness, having sin, or we have the cleansing of God, which puts us into the light. That's why verse 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, you see, we don't have to make this up. It's all right there. You say, if we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins... 
Again, name and cite him to God. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That would be sin in our life. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And again, you know, I just can't uh, stop or not mention that, you know, how much it uh, pains me when I hear uh, uh, pastor teachers talking about, you don't need to confess your sins. Oh, this is, that's not how it applies, and it's not the filling of the Spirit, and it's not fellowship with God. Absolutely wrong. It's right there in black and white. Sin, righteousness, darkness. Again, that's all one side of the equation. Light, confession of sin, holiness, that's the other side of the equation. You can't have both. If you're in darkness, you can't just all of a sudden transfer yourself to the light, as they would have you think. What you need to do is go back to the cross of Jesus Christ and remember that your sins have been forgiven. Confess them to God. Again, non-meritorious uh, confession and act of faith. You don't have to be contrite. You don't have to even pay penance for them. You just have to name and cite them, and you are cleansed from all unrighteousness. You're in fellowship with the light once again, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three members of the Trinity in view. So again, light illustrates the essence of God. He is light. If we are going to have a relationship with Him, we can't have sin upon our soul post-salvation. We have to be walking in light, which calls for a cleansing, as we've just noted, and in other passages I've showed you in the past. And ultimately, then we are walking in holiness, and we are functioning in the personal quality that is God. Again, we too are light just as He is light. We too are holy just as He is holy. And what we are doing then is shining His deity forward. We're shining that forward to the world when we are walking in the light. And again, our good works are going to shine forth. We will be the city set upon a hill, a light that cannot be hidden. So the literal use of light is also necessary, as we know, for man's existence on earth. In Genesis chapter 3, Ecclesiastes 11, 7, and Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 35, we have the literal use of the stellar or heavenly lights that God is the great creator of. And those things are absolutely necessary for our existence. Again, we could not exist without the sun. Again, we'd freeze and that would be the end of it. With the moon, again, and the whole gravitational force, again, it's all part of life that God has created and the balance of life that has been given to us. And in fact, the entire stellar universe is designed. And again, I've, uh, I love you know, hearing some scientists who are Christian-based uh, scientists uh, talk about this, where they talk about the entire galaxy and also all the galaxies combined are designed to be functioning and operating in such a way so that this one little bitty speck of a planet called Earth can sustain life absolutely amazing when they talk about, you know, the distance from the sun, the distance from the center of the galaxy, and how everything's motioning and moving just so this earth can sustain life. Again, and it becomes from the source of light, and that is God the Father who has given us the light so that we can have physical existence here on planet earth. So divine guidance of Israel, as we also noted, Jesus noted in, uh, uh, in the gospel of Matthew that I just read to you. But we also see in the Old Testament that God was always a guiding light for the people of Israel. He was a guiding light that would provide for them. He would lead them. He would uh, protect them when the enemy was bearing down on them. And he would preserve them. Remember, they walked through the wilderness for 40 years. And I love the aspect of not only the manna that he fed them with, which is a perfect sustenance for them each and every day, but you also know that their moccasins never wore out. Did you know that, that their shoes that were made out of leather never wore out 40 years? Now, I bought, or I was given a gift from L.L. Bean of a pair of slippers, a moccasin slippers, that had rubber soles on them that are even more durable than, you know, just having the moccasin by itself. And I've had them for about eight, nine years. They've just about worn out, okay? Forty years walking in the wilderness or desert, the soles of their shoes never wore out. 
And that's a great principle I remember using one time. Uh, we went down to you know, Carolinas and, uh, on a vacation a few years ago, and uh, we took the old car, the old beast that we used to call it. The tires were pretty bad on that car, okay? Probably shouldn't have gone on a long trip on that, you know, in, with the tires in that car. They weren't bald, so they had some tread on them. But all the way down and all the way back, I said, Lord, just let us get down and back without any problems. As you allowed your people of Israel's moccasins not to wear out, please don't let the tires wear out on this car and get us there safely. And we did, okay? We did. You say, oh, that would have happened anyway. I don't think so, okay? You should have seen that car. But in any case, uh, uh, it, you know, it's, it's part of the faith rest drill. It's part of trusting in the promises of God. As our Lord protected and guided and led Israel, wandering through the wilderness, led them out of captivity of Egypt, as I'm going to show you a, f- a few scriptures right now, in Exodus, and then we see the Psalms, and then we see it in the New Testament as well. God has done that for the people of Israel, His people of Israel, and He's doing it for you each and every day as well because you are His children just as much as the Israelites are His children as well. So let's look at some scripture in Exodus chapter 10. In verse 23, it says, They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwelling. You know the ten plagues that came on the people of Israel? One of them was a plague of darkness. And none of the Egyptians, I should say it came upon the Egyptians, none of the Egyptians could see. They couldn't see where they were going for three days and three nights. But somehow, some way, there was light in the house of all the Israelites. He gave them light when there was nothing but darkness in the rest of the empire called Egypt. So in Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, And the Lord was going before them, now leading them, as He led them out of captivity and as He uh, led them through the wilderness for the 40 years. And the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. Yeah, literally, by day and by night. But you know what that also says? When you're in fellowship and when you're out of fellowship. Or we could even say when you're in fellowship and walking uh, in, 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 uh, with God and when there is nothing but darkness all around you. You may still, you know, not that you have p- potentially sinned in this case, but when darkness is all around you. When sin and evil and Satan cosmic system is all around you, trying to overcome you, trying to get you to live in that lifestyle, trying to beat you down to live in a certain way according to the world's measures and standards. Again, the light of God is there in your life so that you can understand that this is just sin and Satan and evil. This is not the way I should be living my life. And instead, I'm going to live in holiness and righteousness each and every day. So again, we see the literal analogy of the pillar of fire uh, by night and the cloud by day that led the Israelites to uh, continue to travel day and night. But God is always there for us, whether we're in a holy, righteous place like the local assembly right now. Not a lot of sin, hopefully, going on right now anywhere. Okay, no sin, no sin, no sin anywhere. Okay, good. All right, a lot of holiness and righteousness going on. But when you go out into that world, you're surrounded by it. You're surrounded by darkness. So again, the light can still be there with you. And don't think that you just need to succumb to the darkness. Ephesians, excuse me, uh, Exodus chapter 14. Verse 20 says, So it came between the camp in Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus the one did not come near the other all night. This is when the Egyptians had a second thought about releasing the the Israelites from captivity, and the army came down to capture them and maybe kill them off or bring them back into slavery. And what happened? The pillar of fire went between the encampment of the Israelites and the Egyptians so that the two could not come together. In other words, the Egyptians were held at bay. And I love how it says, and darkness came. Okay, Again, literally the night came, but again, the Egyptians representing sin and evil coming and bearing down upon them, God kept it at bay. And when you have the light of Jesus Christ in your life, you will uh, keep at bay or He will keep at bay for you sin and evil and wickedness from penetrating your soul and becoming part of your soul. He'll keep it at bay, as you know, when you take in the Word of God. 
So again, we call about call that pillar or that cloud the Shekinah glory, the light of Jesus Christ. And that light of Jesus Christ is indwelling you, but it needs to function and operate as well through the Word of God. So again, when you have that Word resonant within your soul, it will keep sin at bay. So it doesn't attack you, it doesn't overwhelm you, and it doesn't run you down so that you then enter into the night and enter into the darkness. All right, in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 16, it says, And I will lead the blind by a way they do not know. In paths they do not know. I will guide them. I will make darkness into light before them and rugged places into plains. These are the things I will do. I will not leave them undone. So again, this is encouragement even for the unbeliever that God will always create a path for their salvation. Again, a potential for their salvation. He'll always create a path. He'll always create a way for them to come to salvation. But remember, He can't make them come to salvation. Again, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Again, they've got to use their own volitional responsibility to say yes to the path and the illumination that Jesus has led to them. And then, you know, and, and every believer that gets thrown, every unbeliever that gets thrown into the eternal lake of fire is going to be without excuse. And God will reveal to them that there was a path and He smoothed out the way so that ultimately they could come to salvation, but they rejected it over and over and over again. All right, then we have in uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 12, it says, The night is almost gone. Again, uh, we read this already. And the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So as we go forward in our spiritual walk each and every day, let's not get overwhelmed by the darkness. This world, this darkness is about to be done away with. But let's now be even more emboldened, be more motivated to live in the light of Jesus Christ and live even though we're in this dark world and the sinful world that we're in as we have put on the armor of light. It will lead us through the way. So God's eternal promises are also depicted by light. Again, what He tells in His promises for the future in Isaiah, Zechariah, Colossians, and also we've uh, read uh, on Tuesday in regard to Revelation 21 and 22. The inheritance that we have is given to us by God, again, by the light, and ultimately that inheritance will be illuminated for all of eternity by the light of God Himself. So again, the promises that He's given for the eternal state are also depicted as light. And light depicts God's warnings and judgment as well. Again, discipline and judgment that he brings on to the discipline for the believer, divine judgment onto the unbeliever. And that too is, is categorized as light because all divine discipline for the believer and all punitive judgment for the unbeliever is designed for them to learn something. And again, if you've been under divine discipline or if you're under divine discipline right now, it's designed for you to learn something, to learn something about what you have been doing that you should stop doing and what you haven't been doing that you should start doing. It's designed to teach us. That's why it can be called light. Again, God doesn't just discipline or judge for the sake of discipline and judgment because He gets kicks out of it. No, He does it to teach. It's a teaching mode. It's a teaching opportunity. It's a teaching operation. So we need to learn from these things as God disciplines us from time to time in our lives as we uh, stumble and fall or uh, walk in sin or whatever the case may be. We have to learn from that situation, make the appropriate corrections, and go forward in glory with God. So again, a lot of verses that talk about that in Scripture. In regard to the judgment, we can also see the justice of God is plainly called light, especially in Isaiah chapter 51, verses 4 and 5, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. So the justice of God, His just and right judgments, every judgment that He makes is just and fair and absolutely right. And that is also called light because, too, it comes from a place of wisdom. It comes from a place of teaching as well. Again, God doesn't make arbitrary decisions. All His decisions come with full understanding and wisdom. Just as He gave that wisdom to Solomon, 
when the two ladies were bickering over who baby this little baby was or who this kid was. Solomon said, all right, let me take the baby. I'm going to cut it in half. You each get a half if you can't tell me who the true mother is. And his wisdom shed light as to who the true mother was because the true mother had compassion and love for the baby and said, okay, give it to her. You know, I'd rather her have it than for the baby to die. And instantly Solomon knew that was the mother. And the other one said, oh, give me, give me, give me. I, I want this baby. And he knew it wasn't her baby because she didn't have compassion for the baby. So, again, it's light because it has wisdom, it has knowledge, it has illumination in regard to it. The justice of God in all that he does. In Isaiah 51, verse 4, it says, Pay attention to me, O my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For a law will go forth from me, and I will set my justice for a light of the people's. And isn't that interesting? What does he set as a light for the people? Law. And again, I know our current president is talking about you know, being the law and order president. Well, that's great. That's fantastic because that's the type of president we need. Somebody that brings law and order and holds up the standards of law and order because what does it do? It sheds light. It illuminates. It brings holiness and righteousness. And remember, laws aren't designed for people who who uh, are living by the law, I should say, who are living righteously and in love. That's Romans chapter 13. But the law is for those who break it, to stop them from breaking it so that they don't have a harm and detrimental effect on the rest of society or any member of society. That's what the law is for. So again, it's light. And God gave Israel a law so that the light could come forward and people could be protected. And ultimately, it also pointed to who? The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the great lawgiver of all, the great giver of salvation as well. Then we see in verse 5 of Isaiah 51, My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms, again talking about strength, will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait for me, and for my arm they will wait expectantly. Again, they're waiting for my strength. That's what's in view there. And when we have law, again, you know, law according to the Word of God, as we know, again, having law over our own soul, having law in our own life by saying no to sin and temptation and saying yes to holiness and righteousness, when we have that law, it becomes strength within our soul. And if you have a weakness of a sin that you give into from time to time or something that seems to be getting the better of you time and time again, what does it say? Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon Him expectantly and say, God, I'm struggling with this thing. Show me the way out. and Show it to me now. And He will. He'll show it to you. He'll give you the Word. He'll give you some kind of situation will come and the Word of God will come into your soul or somebody else will share it with you and ultimately you'll know what to do. You'll have the right information when you wait upon the Lord. But if you're going to go off and do it your own way, then ultimately you're, you're saying no to the provisions of God. So Jesus Christ as the manif manifest person of the Godhead is also called light, as we know, in John chapter 8, verse 12, and 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse uh, 16. Let me get two more points in and then we'll uh, leave for tonight. The gospel, as I said to you at the outset, is called light. Light then means salvation. So again, we have another analogy of light, not only the gospel, but salvation. Again, the illumination of a new life and, and being saved from our sins is found in that phrase, light. And again, a lot of verses up there for you to understand and note. Uh, in, um, uh, again, Ephesians 5.8, one of our passage, uh, passages, one of those. 1 Peter 2.9, which we read, I think, on Tuesday night, if not on Sunday. John 3.19 and also Acts 26.23. Again, uh, let me just get this last one in, and if you need those notes, I'll come back to it. But the light of the gospel also is told to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that penetrates our heart and grants us insight to the knowledge of our salvation. So again, when we talk about the common grace of God, and then the efficacious grace of God the Holy Spirit. We talk about the common grace that the gospel message is delivered to all. Efficacious grace is the Holy Spirit taking the faith of an individual who heard the gospel and makes it real for their salvation. That's the gospel of light. It penetrates the heart and ultimately it grants insight of knowledge so that people can understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and then come to faith if they so choose to do so. 
And so again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, and 2 Corinthians 4, 6 speak to that point in principle in regard to the gospel being light. All right, so that's a lot of information in regard to the light of God and how we should be utilizing it and functioning it within our lives. And we'll come back on Sunday, and I've got a few more points and principles inside this doctrine uh, so that we understand how to walk in the light as children of light. All right, so let's just close in prayer right now. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the light of your word that has come into our lives, Father. And we just ask that the light shine brighter and brighter in our hearts and in our souls more and more each and every day so that we are illuminated and edified and thereby glorify you as we walk in glory and in service unto you. And Father, we ask that you give us travel blessings on the way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, with that, you are dismissed. If you need me to go back over...